When I think of the word star, I think of Juliette Starrett. She's an entrepreneur and attorney, and the co-founder and CEO of San Francisco CrossFit, one of the first 25 CrossFit gyms, or as they call them, boxes in the world. She's also the co-founder of mobilitywad.com and nonprofit standupkids.org. She's won two world championships and holds five national titles for the U.S. Women's Extreme Whitewater Team. I mean, can I say real life hero? <laughs> Juliet is my hero in this episode because she opens wide up about her battle with cancer, her very difficult pregnancy, and leading her very cushy job as an attorney to chase her wildest dreams. This is to the hero in you. But I am so honored to be here in my second home interviewing you. We're so excited. I know, finally, huh? We're so excited. Um, I know, I am, I am so excited because, you know, I came here to really to get a good workout in. Um, and every time I would drive uh, past this box, I would see people look like the Hunger Games. <laughs> and it taught me a lot about facing my fears coming here. Um, personally, professionally, and spiritually, I felt like I've grown so much. So I really wanted to thank you for holding the space for us to do that. Well, you're so welcome. And you've been such a positive, like joyful member of our community. So mm -hmm. it's a pleasure. Total pleasure. I, thank you so much. I think one of the things that I have learned so much here is just facing my fears as a kid. I'm very open about telling people that, you know, there's certain people in my family. I have a very supportive family, but, you know, there, a lot of them are Chinese Chinese. So they'll, yeah. be, they'll be like, oh, you're fat, you're ugly, you know? And as an American kid growing up here in America, that really did a lot to my self-esteem. So I wrote a blog that I shared with you guys that, that, you know, I wrote as a love letter to myself after you know, my first year here, I think I've been coming here almost five years. And it instantaneously got over 8,000 yeah. shares and likes That's and all amazing. that. amazing. So it's helped me kind of face those fears. Um, and I wanted to talk about your journey here with fear and just starting this amazing, sp I don't even know what you call this, this space, this place, yeah. this home, yeah. my second home. Yeah, it is. It's like a second, it's like a second home for people. I think that's the best way to think of it. And your blog was so awesome. Oh, it thank was you. so honest and personal, and that's why so many people loved it. It had really had nothing to do with the fact that it was CrossFit or anything. It was just about you and your journey. It was so awesome. You know, it's funny because I, I wrote it as a love letter to myself after my year mark here because I was really scared. Because driving past, it looks like literally the Hunger Games. Yes. And being an athlete now and going through it, there are so many misconceptions um, about CrossFit. Massive misconceptions. And, Massive. I, and I got, you know, that it's a cult. And I was like, if people look like that, Jack didn't look that good, I wanna be a part of that cult. <laughs> You're so right. Well, you know, when we first started, um we first found CrossFit in 2003, and Kelly found it first, and he said, I found this like awesome thing, I'm so excited. Like, I've been reading these blogs about kettlebell swings and Olympic lifting, and I found this place that's talking about both things at the same time, I'm so excited, we're gonna do these workouts at the gym. And I go to CrossFit.com, and especially in the early days, all that was on there were like these photos of like military guys holding AK-47s <laughs> and doing workouts, and I was like, wow, okay, so Kelly's in like a neoconservative military <laughs> cult, and this is totally weird, and I can't share this with all my friends because they're gonna think I'm weird. And so there are, I mean, even back then, there were so many misconceptions about what this is, what's going on. So in terms of like taking the risk and facing your fears, were you at first honestly like, you're crazy? Or were you just like totally like, yes, I'm game? Well, I think it was kind of both. I mean, I thought it was a little crazy, but also it, we both happened to find this you know, thing at a time in our life where we'd both been professional athletes. It had been about three years since we'd retired. I had become a lawyer. Kelly was in physical therapy school and we were doing this thing where we were like going to a regular gym every day and we would like stare master and then do like some lat pull downs and we were like that. completely uninspired. Yeah. And so we both had this long background of being athletes and working out and training and being professional athletes. And we were just like, Bleh. like we just didn't want to go to, I mean, we did because that's what we do is like, we love to train, but we were totally uninspired and we found our first CrossFit workout and you know Kelly went in and did it at Club One in Oakland and it was like Cindy or something and he just got crushed like he's seeing online that people are getting you know 17 or 18 rounds and Kelly gets like nine rounds I mean he'll probably correct that but he get you know we just start doing these little workouts in the global gym and getting crushed but it was so exciting because even though we had this major athletic background both of us we were terrible and we realized we had so much to learn and so that's what's kept us so engaged for so long is just it's so skilled focused and movement and mechanics focused and it's just fun and you know you immediately started creating 
community around it and doing these workouts with other people. So it was like you had something to look forward to. Um, obviously, we saw results really quickly, but that was really secondary, the fact that it was like intellectually interesting and totally fun to do it and actually like not scary. And it wasn't like some weird, you know, military cult. Yeah. Like it turned out that it was just fun yeah, I'm, and exciting. I'm, I'm, yeah, I always tell people you can't knock it till you try it. And right. I, you really resonated with me when you were saying, you know, you go to the gym, I would do like back and try, chest Right, it was like try and buy a day, yeah. yeah. And then legs and abs or whatever. Right, right. And I just got so bored. It's and so boring. I found this through my brother who was doing it and he would look jacked and I was like, ooh, what's that? And like, he yeah. literally took me out to the front yard, my brother dot. And he like had me do some snatches and he was like, you're really good. You should check it out. Yeah. And you should go see Kelly because every single box or gym right. that I go and visit when I, I'm know. traveling, they're like, oh, Kelly, Juliet, ooh, Kelly. the star yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, You know, which is, I'm not right. saying that as, you right. know, like, but it's, it's funny because it's just, you guys are so much like family to me now. And that fear has totally gone away. Like I would, yeah. I was really afraid. I couldn't even do a pull up. Well, me either. And you're not alone because I take so many phone calls from people who want to start here and they're like, okay, okay, same thing. Like I was at work and this guy's been doing CrossFit yeah. and he's totally jacked and he's super into it and I want to try it. Except for, I think I'm going to join a gym yeah. so that I can get, get fit, fit enough yes. before I come here. And I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no. Like that's not the point. Like we're here to help get you fit and you can start from zero and we're, it may be scary, but we're actually not scary. Like you've got to just come in one time and try it. And it's certainly not for everybody. I mean, it's not for everybody, but it's also for a lot more people people than than they think yeah you know it's the funny thing is people always say you know you have to be I, I want to go and stretch a lot before I go to yoga class no the idea is you go so that you right. can be stretchy <laughs> you know right <laughs> and, that's the whole point yeah. of yoga and I think what sets you guys aside so much that I really love is really it's really it's a community like a lot of you guys I really it's like I really call you guys my fit fam yes because you come in and you know there's new people every single class what sets you guys aside from a lot of boxes well pretty much most boxes I've been to is that you guys have us introduce each other to one another and then you actually get on us you do get scary and yell at us no if when, you don't when, introduce we, we, yourself yeah, yes yeah. because yeah, you, that's yeah well, this is uh, actually Kelly started it early on when we opened our gym and that. it just we actually it was su such a positive part because we did constantly have new people coming in. And, you know, I was just telling you last time we talked that recently I just went to the spinning class and it was actually really a good reminder for me to go because even though I've been to a bunch of spinning classes and I'm pretty fit and athletic and whatever, I was like yeah, kind of nervous. Yeah, yeah because right. Anytime yes. you try anything new, you're it's new. like, right, it's like being the new kid at school for the first time. It doesn't matter whether it's CrossFit or Orange Theory or whatever you're doing, you're like the new kid and you're nervous. And, you know, that's how, it was such a good reminder because that's how people feel when they start this or anything new and that's just been such a like we're so, something we're so proud of that it's like you know part of our training for all our new staff like this is what we do here we have tons of visitors and this is scary for people the first time they come and it's really disarming if you come in and you think oh my god I don't know anyone and in five minutes you're introduced and you realize you're probably not the only new person and you know you immediately make friends and you know my friend Kenny Kane actually used this like um, he just I just was talking to him yesterday. He owns CrossFit Los Angeles, but sort of he used this metaphor for like a CrossFit gym being like an oak tree. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think about this oh. place in a lot of ways, because, you know, it's um, like there's so many acorns that have spawned from it. Right. Like there's probably something like 16 CrossFit gyms that have opened out of people that were members here or coaches here. And I mean, I don't even know how many people have gotten married because they met yeah. here. And then when I look at my Facebook feed every single yeah, night, Instagram, like, yeah. my Facebook and Instagram are all people who have become friends because they met here. Here. And I mean, this is long lasting because we've been open for 13 years now. So I see people who've moved all over the country and they stay connected with people they met here. So it's just like, you know, I think you have it right. Like the, 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 the thing that's special here is the community. I mean, it's great that we all work out together and that's a cool thing. And it's wonderful to transform your body and gain confidence that way. But like the critical thing is the community. Yes, absolutely. And I think another myth that we have outside of the community too is that, oh, you're going to get injured. I can't tell you how much, like, not hate emails, but concern emails. Right. Oh, you're going to, you're going to really like your job, blah, blah, blah. You're going right. to, yeah. Right. So I, you know, I, the times that I really injured myself were the times that I had to really think about why and why I wasn't paying attention right. or being mindful. Right. That's another thing I learned about being here too. It's just being mindful of my space. So inside the box and outside of the, the box, I really live my life in a, in a way that I am aware of how am I driving? Am I slouching like this? Or am I 
yeah. you know, sitting right. straight up. Or when or I'm like when you pick up your groceries, yes. are you organized? Absolutely. And, right. Washing dishes, which I hate washing dishes as it hurts my back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like, are you squeezing your butt? Right. You know, and, uh, you know, we're, you're talking about, you know, being the new kid on the block and, you know, coming, people coming here and just meeting new people. You guys were really one of the new kids on the block in 2000, you said three or four. Yeah. Um, were you scared of taking that risk as an entrepreneur? Because, you know, we're fellow Dons, mm. USF. Go Dons, yeah. go Dons. And you're, you know, you're a yeah. lawyer with this fancy title. Yes. You talk openly about yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it was, well, let me start by saying that um, when we opened the gym, we had no vision that it was going to be a business that would actually ever make money and support us. Um, <laughs> really? We really started it because we fell in love with it. And, you know, we actually, st we were living in a flat in San Francisco, and we started doing it, just the two of us, in our backyard. And then <laughs> our landlords who lived upstairs, they were interested, and they came down and started doing it. And then some friends came over, and we actually started this little training mm. group at like 6 o'clock in the morning. And one morning, um, next door a guy yells out his window and he's like shut the f up <laughs> and then that's when kelly and i are like okay it might not work for us to continue to do these yeah, workouts at six yeah. o'clock in the morning With in the crowded slamming, san yeah. francisco right like we were definitely being obnoxious <laughs> so we found a little space and the presidio was actually outside in a parking lot and again like we totally did not start it we were like we've, we've created this thing that we created a little teeny community of like 15 people who were excited to train together and we're like we need a different space and we need more space and we need a little more equipment so we just really we we totally did not start it and also you know we didn't start it to make money or have it be a business but also what was interesting is we like to call it like the wild west of crossfit back then you know nowadays if you open a crossfit it's like you can get investors and you can talk to 15,000 other gym owners to get ideas about systems and you yeah. know different tools you can use to run your business and ideas about how to grow and market and i mean you name it there's information and advice there's everywhere thousands of boxes. Yeah. but when we started there we're, we're the 25th crossfit there were not really any CrossFits and every any CrossFit, you know, even though there were 25, everybody was brand new like we were. We all just were like, this is awesome. And we love this. And none of those other 25 people were running it as a business, by the way, either. They were all like hobbyists. And so it was, you know, it definitely was exciting to be part of this emergent phenomenon. Um, and it, the sort of fear part of it for me didn't really emerge until 2009, 10, when so I was- Several years later, yeah. Well, yeah, because we'd been running it. I still had a full-time job as a lawyer where I was making plenty of money. And Kelly actually, for the first two years we owned the gym, he had a regular like physical therapy job at a, a fancy um, orthopedic sports clinic here in the city. And so we were just doing this as a complete hobby. Like Kelly would work as full-time, he would, for for the first six months we owned the gym, he would coach at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. and work a full-time job like, in between uh, yeah. seven days a week. You know, he would do it. That's called commitment. Week. Commitment, because we just loved it. Yeah. And then we hired our first coach, Adrian Bosman, who's now like a oh, famous, Adrian, yeah, yeah, famous yeah. CrossFit coach, yeah. um, six months in, and then Kelly was able to like just do half the classes. So we really grew very slowly, which was nice because we both had these steady income jobs. So we didn't have to, you know, when we had a, a positive number in our San Francisco CrossFit bank account, we'd be like, we could buy more barbells, yeah. <laughs> you know? And um, there was just no stress around it in those early years. Um, but after three years, Kelly decided we, he was also um, decided he could run a little physical therapy clinic in the gym. And we felt like, okay, like our first risk is, okay, this has actually kind of become a business despite ourselves. And Kelly wants to take physical therapy clients at the gym. So he left his job, but we were like not ready for us both to commit. It was like way too big and of a risk. And this time, did you have your time. two daughters yet? Or? We had our two daughters okay. at this point. And then in 2009, um, for a variety of reasons, but mostly because the gym was really exploding, we actually had started our second business business mobility wad and that's when like there it took me I would say almost two years to get up the guts to quit my law firm job and do this full time um, and I actually was interesting I thought my family would think I was totally crazy I thought they'd be like you are crazy you know you are just about to become partner at this fancy law firm like what are you doing and you're making good money making really good money yeah. like very good money like like like, like epic money about yeah like 300,000 yeah. yeah and um and it was just super interesting to see my parents who have followed more traditional career paths were actually like, you should totally do it. Like, we fully support this, like it's smart. And you know, the other sort of inspiration for me, and it's funny because he's now become my friend, but I read Tim Ferriss's book, The yes. Four Hour Work Week. Yes. And um, you know, I, I certainly was never planning to work four hours, but it was inspirational to me in realizing that like, I really wanted to sort of, like I wanted to decide what 
my life was going to be like. And while I enjoyed practicing law, what I didn't like about it was my lack of control of my schedule and yeah. my time and my choices. And I thought, wow, we've started this thing. Like I, I am in. I was in this. I realized I was in this really unique position because there's a lot of unhappy lawyers. Yes. But I was in this position where I'm like, wow, I actually there's another thing I already have that's already established. I can go do this. And then a, a lawyer friend of mine said, hey, you know, Juliet, like you could quit your lawyer job and go run this business for five years and if it yeah. doesn't work yeah. out they're like you're gonna be 40 years old yeah. you can go back and practice law for another 30 years yes. and i was like bingo yeah. and Good. you don't want to have regrets that's the worst right. thing so i did i felt like it i think it's given us both kind of a peace because we've we, we have these like fallbacks yeah. right like it was a huge risk for us because we have two of us in one household doing the same thing which is risky and two kids you have and to support two kids we have to support and you know overhead and employees and all this stuff so it's a risk um and it's a new business model too no, i mean not a lot of no, people knew about crossfit no, i remember kelly like, talking I, about like he want he needed like eight rings for ring rows and he had to like thatch it together because yeah. he couldn't afford we them. Had to and buy he these buy. weird plastic <laughs> rings that were like at Love marine that. supply stores, and then we would attach them to cam straps. Oh and, my god! You know, it was just yeah, it was just exactly. It wasn't it wasn't an established thing, and you know, but it, obviously we have like I closed the door on being a lawyer, and I've never looked back, mm. and. It was the best decision I ever made because, you know, A, I love what I do. I have tons of flexibility, so I actually like see my own kids and get to hang out with them, um, which was really important to me. I felt like if I was gonna, like if I continue to practice law and become a partner, which was the path I was on, it was gonna be this sort of like, okay, you're about to not see your kids that much except for on the weekends. And this has just really afforded me this wonderful balance. What I will say is when I left my law practice, I thought I would work less. And I don't. I work more. Same here. I mean, like, when you do what you love, yes. though, it never feels like work. Right. And I just do it when I can, right? Like, if I need to be at my kid's band concert at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, I can. Yes. You know, and that might mean I need to, like, get on my computer at 9 p.m. at night, but that's fine. But it also allows you, I love that you were telling me the other day that you you have, that you started this, like, walking club oh, where yeah. you walk your walking kids to school. Walking school bus. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> I love it. Walking so, school bus. Yeah, it's called a walking school bus, and it wasn't my original idea. Other people have done it, so it was an inspiration for me. But um, as you know, we put standing desks, you know, we have our nonprofit yes. stand-up kids where we put standing desks in public school. Schools. But as part of that, one of the things I noticed and a part of the research around stand-up kids and Kelly and I's book Deskbound is that I found out that like in 1975, like 80% of kids walked to school and now today it's like 12% of kids walk to wow. school. And yet um, in most communities, people don't live more than like a mile and a half from school. So mm. it's not that like, they can't walk to school, but it's just been a, a, like, a total custom. Yeah. It's a cultural shift, right? People got really scared because of TV and the internet that their kid was going to get kidnapped if they walked to school. And, you know, there were just a lot of things going on and then we just became so car focused. And so I realized, I was like, first of all, the front of our school is like the unhappiest place in the morning. <laughs> it, there's no grumpy, parking. It's tired. crowded. Everybody's grumpy. People are dropping their kids off in the drop-off lane and the kids are rolling out of the car and People they can't get out and everybody's hangry. And it's like, it's just like not a good environment, right? And so, and, and I was like, and that's not a good way for a kid to start school. Like a kid needs to get some physical activity. Our kids aren't moving enough. So changing your mindset by just changing your mindset. between and we the have, walk. We've had this like transformative experience. We meet on a corner and parents can either join us or they can drop their kid off at a set time. And you know, we Love have that. anywhere from like 15 to 50 kids on any given day walking with us and what's been super interesting is we have a bunch of parents who come every day even though they didn't plan to and they say like they this is like the first time they've ever got regular exercise like this is it for them wow. they're like I love they're like I'm most people yeah and they're like I'm so excited to be back at school not because I'm I want to get into routine but because all summer I miss the walking <sighs> school bus um, and it's like it's really nice for Kelly and I too because we it's like it's probably like a 5k or something we mm -hmm. walk every morning and so by 8 like we're home by 8:15 in the morning we've walked we leave at 7:35 we walk and get home at 8:15 we walk like a 5k and so if our day completely devolves and like we never have a chance to work out or get any other exercise we're like hey we already walked a 5k like, yeah yeah we're like we're good so you're literally like walking the walk but I love yeah. how you like talk the talk too cuz you're real about you know it was really scary you know, really to scary. start this business and then to follow this passion, you have to feed your kids. Um, what, what, what point were you like, you know what, paying attention to your surroundings and saying, you know what, I'm looking at these people around me at work and yeah. 
That was another no, huge part happy, of my okay. decision. Yeah, when I was in the, you know, one of the things that, that I started looking at in this sort of two year process Paying that attention. took me yeah. is I looked forward at all the people that were like professionally ahead of me, at all the partners and senior they attorneys ahead paper. of me. Yeah, and I was like, wow, like none of them seem happy. Or fit. And they definitely yeah. are not healthy. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and I'm talking about health for like um, many Physical, ways. Like mental, many people spiritual. divorced yeah. and yeah. never seeing their kids. Overweight. And, and overweight or drinking or doing drugs. Right? Like, right. There's just like, you name it and like lawyers have it. Not all of them, of course. Mm -hmm. That's a broad generalization. But I looked ahead of me and I was like, wow, like I see these guys ahead of me, these partners, and they may be making a million dollars a year, but they're 68 years old working 80 hours a week. I'm like, that looks terrible. Like, I don't want that to be me. That's um, so interesting. You yeah. know what's interesting too is that I feel like here in America people work, 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 work so much to attain all this money but you know what? You can never buy back your health. No. And so you got to balance. And also it's so precious. Like life is so, yes. I just like the, the connectedness. Oh, the, the connectedness and the preciousness and I really am like very conscious of the fact and you know maybe it's because I had cancer when I was 21 but I'm like always like hyper conscious of the fact that like I could walk out the store after this interview and get mowed over by the Muni. Yes. And like. It happens a lot in San Francisco. Right. And I'm like you gotta like live and enjoy. <laughs> so here's the takeaway. Ding, 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 ding. Pay attention. I'm gonna say it again. Pay attention, pay attention. Never does an unhappy journey lead to a happy destination. And I know this is a hard one because conventional wisdom will tell you that, you know, you gotta suffer and suffer and work for the pain. But if it really doesn't feel good, you know it and you're betraying yourself. So if you're not enjoying your way through what you're doing, you're not gonna be happy at the end. And now back to the conversation. That's what I love so much about our little conversations in between the workout before and after class. We talk about life and I love this question that I heard um, on, I think, Impact Entrepreneur. They asked like, how do you measure life? Right, and that's yeah. a, such a deep question because it's a for deep me, question. I measure it in the little talks that we had. Like I was like, "Oh, what you eating?" Like yeah. the other day, yeah. you made your little breakfast. Yeah, my breakfast thing. Yeah, my two eggs yeah. and my vegetables. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, I went home and made it. And I threw know, some and then sriracha. you put it on Instagram. Yeah, yeah right. I had sriracha on mine too. <laughs> I know, sriracha, <laughs> and a little bit of uh, truffle salt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. fancy it up yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I had like Himalayan sea salt <laughs> on mine. But that's what I love yeah. so much about this is that that human connection. And the funny thing yeah. is, you know, um, for people that look on the internet and Google, you guys are like, "Oh my God." The Star X, they're like a badasses, big deals. But you know what? If you kind of go backwards, you guys did face a lot of challenges. Yeah. You know, you yeah. had your pregnancy scare. Yes. Right. Well, the placenta. Yeah, you know, it's funny because people. Um, uh, it was a couple of years ago where Kelly, someone said to Kelly, they're like, you guys are like an overnight success. Yeah. And yes. we literally Everybody laugh. thinks that, We yes. literally laugh because we're like, wow, like we have been just grinding away for years. Yes. You know, like literally <laughs> no. we're like, you Nobody know, sees teaching that. 6 a.m. Like cross, zigzag. you know, Kelly was like teaching 6 a.m. CrossFit classes in a parking lot for like six years. And, you know, and then when we started Mobility Wad, there were like years where he was on the road like half the year, you know, like pounding the pavement and getting the word out about our brand and teaching courses or whatever. So we literally like, sn you know, like snorted yeah. our coffee out of our nose and we're like, we're totally an overnight success. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work, but yeah, I mean there, um, I had a really awful birth with my daughter, Caroline. Um, and, and Caroline's the younger one. She's the yeah, younger Georgia's one, 2008. One. I had this thing called placenta previa. Yeah. My sister had that. Oh God, it's horrible. It's where the it's placenta horrible. is at the opening. Yeah, it attaches and so you have to have a C-section, but yeah. the big concern is your hemorrhaging. Yes. So I literally lost half the blood in my body. Oh my God. And um, one of the things I remember after Caroline was born and, and a weird thing happened, I'll tell you, but there were these, there were these like interns that right after she was born that were like pushing cold blood into my oh, body. My like, God. you know, you through don't just let it. Yeah, right? you don't let it just drift through the IV, they were like pushing it into Just my veins. Just because you're losing so much blood. Yes, oh and they were God. worried I was gonna stroke out. So it was really, um, you know, a, one, a couple like beautiful things happened, which were that the I was I had Kaiser, which I'm a fan of Kaiser, mm -hmm. but um, that night they were full when I needed to like have my C-section. Mm -hmm. So they transferred me in an ambulance to UCSF. And that night, the guy who was on duty who did my C-section is literally like this 65 year old guy who's like famous and has written like every book on being an OBGYN like on earth like it just happened to be that guy wow. and and so you know I mean it's like it was sketchy you yeah. know like it's one of those procedures where like I lost so much blood I definitely could have died and instead like I didn't die and mm. then one of the things I was so proud of is um 2008, literally two years almost to the day after she was born I competed in the CrossFit Games. Oh my god. Yeah. And, and that uh, was 
when you you were at your weakest two years before, oh, right? Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, because I had lost so much. I mean, literally, just so weak and you stopped working traumatized. Out too, or? And, no, I mean, I that was another thing that you know this really helped me come back. I mean, spiritually and mentally and physically on every level because you know we'd already started our gym, we already had this huge community, and I was able to. I mean, pretty quickly after, like six weeks after, I was able to like start working out wow. and be back with my community. And um, you know, I was really proud of the fact that I was able to like get CrossFit in enough shape games. that I could oh go gosh. compete at the CrossFit Games. Like that was a huge thing for me. Oh my God. Yeah. So yeah. then before that, so that's when you, you had cancer earlier. When I was 21. School. Yeah. yeah. Thyroid, I was 21. Right? Yes. Yeah. And so how did you discover that? It was just a random physical and this actually a uh, um, nurse practitioner was like, oh, you have like a little thing, you know, you should have a biopsy. And you know, when you're 21, yeah. now today, you can conquer the world. Now you think today, if I went in and sick. had this exact same conversation, I would be like on Google and convinced that yeah. I'm going to die tomorrow. There was no Google back then. There was us. no Google. And also like, I was a kid, you know, I was 21. Yeah. So no part of your brain can go even now today I could easily go to that place where I'm like I definitely have cancer but yeah. when you're 21 like no part of your brain can yes. go that way and so I'll never forget I was literally 21 years old I'm like a junior at Cal and I'm in I am literally like of course living with roommates on my home phone my <laughs> dial up home yeah. phone and they call and there's literally a guy who's like so I'm calling to let you know you have cancer and like you just like literally can't even compete. Change your yeah, day. Yeah, and then people like, like people would be like, "Well, now that you're sick," and what's so weird is like yeah, you don't weird. feel sick. Yeah. I mean, I was like, "Wait." Come some cancers, you don't feel sick. No, yeah. I was like, I'm a like I'm a like a JV yeah. row. I'm on the JV rowing team at Cal, and like I work out three times a day, and I'm totally fit and look healthy, and I'm a kid, yeah. and like no part of me could compute any of that at wow. all. Yeah. And then, so how was that journey like? Was it I mean, a two-year journey? Like you know, I was back pretty quickly. Okay. I was, I literally, like, t I literally, and this is probably because I'm crazy, but I only took a week off of school to oh have a pretty full-on surgery. That doesn't sound crazy for you. Yeah, but I was like, you know, I was like, I don't want to be, A, I was like, I'm not sick. Yeah. I don't want to be sick. And you don't want to be stereotyped like everybody walking yeah, around like you're the victim. Yeah, and I also was like, I just want to get back to my routine because my routine is what makes me happy and fulfills me as a human. I don't want to be like, you know, um, I don't want to be sick. So I had to do that. And then six months later, I had to do radiation, which was also mm. super weird because they literally like handed me like a 10 pound, like this jar that weighed like 10 pounds and then they all ran out of the room and then like through a speaker they're like Juliet take oh the my. four pills oh. it's <laughs> horrifying oh my it was God. horrifying and then I had to be sequestered in a hospital room for like a whole week by myself which that almost drove me crazy because you know yeah. Um, You're so social. But that was really good, you know, yeah. and then I had to, I've been obviously taking synthetic thyroid to supplement my whole life and, um, and, but you know, one thing that was really important for me and I, again, no judgment on anyone who does this, but like, I certainly never wanted to be like someone where like having cancer defined me, like yeah. it didn't define me. It was just yeah. a thing that happened to me and yes. it's not, you know, it's certainly something that impacted how I view the world and it sounds cliche to say, mm -hmm. but you know, when that, like it, it's a, you know, Having that happen to me at 21 years old definitely was like, I need to live my life. life now. Like that happened every day. Yes, absolutely. That happened to me early on when I lost four family members in a year's time. This was right after I graduated from USF. Yeah. And go that Dons. made me, yeah, go Dons. Uh, that made me realize that, oh my God, I really, like, time is limited. I have to live life now. And I don't want to be cheesy, but I, I really believe that, like, I'm a very spiritual person and I feel like the point of spirituality the, when you're cracked open or when you yeah. um, are challenged the most if you I mean what really doesn't kill you does make you stronger yeah, but the does. fact of stuff like that that happens illness that happens to everybody illness yeah. somebody dies accidents really yeah. either wakes you up or you fall deeper or asleep you shut, yeah, you shut yeah. Down. yeah so how does how did cancer and then placenta previa yeah. like all that like what do you make of that it yeah. is a part of your story just yeah, like the deaths is. were right. a part of my story um, right. uh, but at the end of the day, that's just a part of the story. It's not who right. yeah, you that's are. Right. It's not who I am. Yeah, it's just part. I mean, I mean, a couple things like I am super grateful for modern medical technology. Yes. <laughs> and as much as I love like, you know, sort of more hippy trippy like health stuff, which I do, like I'm super grateful that like I'm alive. Yes. I'm both like I yes. could have died on both occasions. Yeah. I'm grateful. The other thing I really took away from both of those things is like, I am not going to die of a preventable illness. Like, I mm. have been determined since I was 21. Like, I mean, obviously, I can't control what I can't control. Like, yeah. I might get Parkinson's or some yeah. kind of other cancer yeah. that I cannot control. But I, like, I was, like, and I think this is part of the reason why I've been so drawn to what I do now and why I've always been so passionate about taking care of myself and my health is that I'm, like, I was, like, I am not. 
like I may die young from something, but it is not going to be from something I could have prevented. Yeah. Right. And so, so it's been a, you know, for me, it's been a big focus, you know, and also, I mean, like anyone, you know, you go through little periods where you're like, why me? Yes. You know, I mean, I yeah. certainly was not always tough the through phase. it all. Yes. Yeah. You have a little phase where you're like, why me? Like, like eh, but, but get uh, over it. Yeah. Right. But at some point I'm like, okay, that's also a choice. I really do believe that a lot of the way we, you know, are in the world is a choice. Yes. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to choose to be emo and feel sorry <laughs> for myself. You know, I'm just going to choose to live my life yes. and try to like share and experience joy yeah, with yeah. people what am and I? have fun mm -hmm. and make connections. Here's the takeaway. We all have choices in life. And Juliet says joy is a choice and that is what she's choosing. Life's too short not to be joyful, right? When you change your perspective, it changes your story and your reality. And one of my favorite quotes from Tony Robbins is that gratitude and fear don't live in the same space. So choose joy and choose gratitude. And now back to the conversation. Really, every morning you were just talking about feeling alive and I just, um, gosh, it just made me think about every morning when I wake up. Because, you know, I just lost my brother-in-law to suicide as well. So, and I've faced a lot of deaths in the family. Um, and it just makes me realize that, you know, I never lost that little f spark inside of me when I was a kid. I, you know, w you know, you become a TV reporter, do what you do, and then you kind of get jaded by people and things and work and all that, right? Um, and the real world. But every morning I wake up and I'm like, ooh, what am I going to do today? Yeah, you're like, like who am I going to meet? What am yeah, I going like, to learn? What's gonna and I get to talk to you and other yeah. people and I teach and I do motivational speaking. And yeah. I just want to inspire people to do what makes you f feel most alive. And I know it's funny because in doing research about you and Kelly, it, it, I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. Like me too. Yeah, Duh. Like, no wonder same. why the universe well, brought us together. We're the same. We're the I know. same. Yeah. We're the same. Um, sister from another mister, brother yeah. from another yeah, mother. Yeah, exactly. But, um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but um, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, we all really have, it, it may sound cheesy, but Forbes quoted this. Um, it's not cheesy. Yeah, no. Forbes, oh, Forbes wrote an real. article on this podcast. I know, right? But they were, you know, they pulled this quote that said, you know, one of the quotes for me that says, I believe we are all born with a unique power. And I believe it's like a superhero power. Yeah, superhero. And it's unique to you. Yeah. And you have to use it to the fullest capacity in the service of others. So I love that when I come here and I'm interacting with you guys, you, everything that you guys do in your life, you are super passionate about. And it makes you feel alive. I know you hate the word passionate, so I no, want to I talk about I that. Don't. Passion. I mean, but <laughs> just when it's overused. It is. It actually yeah. is way yeah. overused yeah. today. But right. what do you call it? Being interested in? Like you should no, do stuff yeah, that I mean, you're interested in. No, yeah, I mean it's hard because in. that's such a great word. But I love it no, too. No, the but, thing yeah. I hate about it, if I can it is clarify. Overused. Yeah, it's overused, and the thing I hate about it, and I call it like the Oprah Winfrey yeah. phenomenon, yes. where everybody's <laughs> supposed to like find what they're passionate yes. about, which I I have, and I feel very lucky that I have, and I know Kelly has, and you have. Um, but I also think people can get an equal amount of joy by doing something they're really good at. Absolutely. And so I think uh, that's the thing. That's the distinction I like to make. You know, just sometimes being super competent at something, even if it's not sexy, because yeah. most people aren't doing things because that are sexy. Because that's what you're good at. Right. I mean, that's what I right. feel like. But, you know, I think it's a, a matter of semantics and words right. and wordsmithing and all that. But I agree. Yeah. It's like a lot of people, like today, I was like, I'm interviewing, you know, uh, Juliet and um, Kelly, and then I have this podcast and I have this nonprofit, and they're like, I feel like nothing. And I'm like, that's not the goal, is to make you feel like no. nothing. Right. It's right. like, there, I, there's two types of people. I feel like there's people like us who, like, w our, our lives, it, it is, is work. It's the same thing. Yeah, like right. we have to do what we're right. They're quote, totally unquote, interconnected. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. They're totally interconnected. Right. I mean, and Kelly some people and not. I, yeah. Kelly and I are like married. Yeah. Happily. Yeah. And we run all these businesses together. It's like yeah. so interconnected. But I think a life lesson too is that you. Um, it's like you. Uh, a mentor told me this when I was younger. Um, Robert Honda. He was a reporter in the San Francisco area, and he was like, you know, Tuan, find what you really love to do, and figure out a way to make money. Right. So it's similar to what you're talking right, about, exactly. and you guys have been right. able to. And I'll, I'll post, all, you know, all, all the stuff that you guys do in, in our blog notes. But it's just, it's just, it makes me feel so alive being here. So I wanted to, you know, connect with you guys because I want just to inspire people to just pay attention and be more uh, self-aware. Um, and one thing I love about you guys too is you guys have all these mind tricks. I didn't expect to come here and then you guys talk about intellectual stimulation while I'm, you know, yeah, like, doing I'm a Russian. To squat. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to squat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, what are you talking about, <laughs> Kelly? Yeah, yeah. You're like, this is intense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so what's next for you? 
Geez, I mean, we have a lot of things. I mean, one thing I'm excited about, um, Kelly and I have been talking about this for years, but I'm working on this book called Death to the Juice, Juice Box with our friend T.J. Murphy. It was, and that's, by the way, Kelly's original title. He thought I of it. It's name. so cute. Yeah, but it's a book about how to raise a healthy kid from age 3 to 18. Um, and what we see is that if you have a kid from zero, like birth or even pregnancy to three, there's like a million books. Like you can literally go to the library and check out a million books and everyone has their different philosophy about what to do and when to potty train and how to have kids sleep and breastfeeding, you name it. There are a million books on the subject about, you know, how to raise a healthy kid from in that age range. But then it's like, there's really nothing from three to 18. And what I've seen in my own life of being a parent and also being in this fitness business is people really are like lost. You know, we live in Marin County, which is like the home Bubble. of the farmer's market. Yes. And yet, you know, people still feed their kids like crap. Isn't I'm not funny? sure how I, else to say it. It's so funny because I go there and there's like all this organic food that the parents buy and then the kids are eating like hot dogs and right. chicken nuggets. Right. And, like people yeah. like make themselves like a kale salad and like a piece of organic meat for dinner but then like their kids are eating chicken nuggets and I get it like there there certainly is a psychology there and like the it's working for them because I, I understand what it's like to be a busy parent. You know, there's, it's like one less battle to have during the day or fight. It's like easy to just feed your yeah. kid a chicken nugget or whatever. And I mean, it's anywhere from sleep to, to how much physical, physical activity kids are supposed to get. So we're really just trying to check off all the boxes and give really practical ideas for like simple practical things parents can do. And, and it's gonna be sort of grouped by age. So if your kid is age, you know, three to eight, like these are the things they should be eating and the amount of sleep they should be getting and what kind of mm -hmm. things they should be doing with physical activity. And, and then, you know, when we get to the older kids, we're gonna talk about like the problems with sports specialization and, you know, whether kids should strength train and of course all the other things like sleep and nutrition. And, you know, because those things change as kids get older. And those are the questions that parents or guardians right. have about their kids. Oh, should my the 10 year old lift weights? Right. Or they what should know. I be feeding them? Right. Yeah. What should we be feeding them? And people really like they people really want to do the right thing, but there just aren't tools. And I don't think anyone's ever really presented it to them in a way that they can fit into their lives. Mm. You know, it doesn't need to be some like crazy thing. You don't need to spend two, you know, if you work till 6.30 at night, like you can't, you don't have time to cook a two hour, like perfect dinner for your kids. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's a work in progress, but that's hey, our goal is to I make it really wait. simple and, you know, easy for parents to follow. And we want it to be the kind of book where like, you maybe don't even read it cover to cover, like you read. It's like an index or yeah, like a. Like you go back, like you read the three to eight year old section when your yeah. kid's in there, and then when your kid's eight, you read that section and, you know. Refer we, to it again. Yeah. Kind of use it yeah. as kind of right. like a guidebook. A guidebook. Yeah. Like we, like my favorite book I read when I was a parent is this book called Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child. And, Ooh. you know, um, Kelly and I are obviously like huge fans of sleep. and. To me, it's like the simplest, easiest thing you can do for your health. And so many sleeping. people don't. No, yes, it's like I love people me do some not sleep. sleep. I love yes. myself some sleep, yeah. and I am like the best. And you know, Kelly and I always feel like we figured out this like secret weapon with our kids because people will say, "Oh my God, your kids are like so nice," and we're literally like, we're probably messing up like ninety-five percent of everything we're doing as a parent. But like the one thing we got right was like we taught them how to be good sleepers when mm. they were really little, wow. and so they like are alive and awake and. I, you know, like this, and literally we're like, oh, we feel like we found this like secret thing that well, no one knows. What's the secret though? You just work them out to death? No. <laughs> <laughs> Which we do, and it's yes. funny, because I'm sure our neighbors are like, wow, those people are weird, but yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, we just wanted to be like a reference book. This was a book Kelly That's and awesome. I used when our kids were little, and we went back and referred to it like literally for the first five years of their lives. We were like militant about like, okay, the sleep thing is huge, and we want to create sort of a, a book under, you know, with a, a same idea that it's the kind of thing parents will go back to and back to and back to. You know, I love so much about all your businesses um, with this book, even this upcoming book um, and CrossFit and Mobility Wad and Stand Up Kids. It's you guys were solving a problem. You weren't yeah. out to like make up a gazillion never, dollars. Never, it like, just so well, happened that yeah, a lot like, of the books that you we, guys. Our you know. biggest business is Mobility Wad, and it started because Kelly had, literally, we had in our parking lot where our gym was, he had rented a shipping container, which was his physical therapy office, and it was uh, lovingly called the Pain Cave, <laughs> which he can tell you more about, but he, um, he would come home at night and say, you know, man, I keep seeing like the same five problems every day. And then I was able to like, he would come home sometimes and like describe people's symptoms. And I would be like, oh yeah, that person has tight hamstrings. Or, you know, I would be able to like armchair diagnose his clients at night at <laughs> home. And I think he really started seeing that, you know, it was like the same like 10 things he's seeing in his clinic. And he's like, 
most of it, like, sometimes he would have a catastrophic injury, but he's like, 90% of the time these people are coming in, it's completely preventable. Mm. And it's because people don't understand how to move, they're not being coached, and they don't have simple tools to fix themselves. So he's like, I'm just gonna start making some videos. So this was like in the early days of YouTube. Before, early we had our YouTube, first yeah. iPhone. We had to do it on an iPhone because we were filming them every single day. Yeah. So our video quality is terrible and audio quality is terrible, but you know, no one really cared because people were so excited. Hungry they're like, for it too. they're hungry. Yeah. They're like, and oh they my God, it. like this is the first time I saw a video. Like I have, Ach you know, like Achilles tendinosis and now I know how I have like tools and strategies to work on it on my own, on my living room couch at night while I watch TV or on my living room floor. And um, so that like we literally, again, that was another business where like we never started that to be a business that like made money. Like Kelly was literally like, I see a problem. I have ideas how to solve it. I'm gonna post all mm -hmm. these videos online. And then it's like blown up into this whole thing. And for people at home that don't know what a mobility, oh, yeah. the mobility wad is. It yes. Um, it is sort of a one-stop shop for information and education on movement, mechanics, health, wellness, in injury prevention, athletic performance. Mm -hmm. um, we put up a video every day that we call the Daily MWOD, um, which is a follow-along video, so you can just like press play on your laptop and sit on your living room floor at night and yep. do a variety of mobility exercises. Um, we teach, we have a big library of courses that we teach online and live. Um, and then, you know, Kelly's written some books, which you're gonna yep. talk to him about. So that's all kind of under that umbrella. I love that you, um, you know, when you discover your, I call it power, people call it passion, whatever word you want to put, but that yes. thing that excites you and makes yes. you feel alive, and then when you give it away, or you, in terms of like sharing the knowledge and yeah. sharing it with people, yeah. it's like multiplied. There's yeah. like this joy that like gets reverberated back to you. Oh, yeah. it's been, I mean, like, like we, again, we literally started Mobility Wad because Kelly's like, I have things to say and there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And like, no, at no point did we ever think it would ever be a business ever, ever, ever. Yeah. And like, and then it's funny because now I read all these business books and people are like, what you need to do is like, you know, create an audience by giving away things that they need. And of course I'm like, wow, we did that, but we didn't even know that yeah. was like a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we literally, it took organic. us. Organic, Kelly it's really called organic. it the Mobility Project yeah. and the goal was to film a video a day for 365 days and we didn't make it. We made it in like maybe 16 months or something. Mm -hmm. Like it was like a little shy yeah. of a year and a half we got all the videos in because you know, sometimes we just couldn't make it yeah. at one a day. Life happens, yeah. Life happens, it was hard to do one a day and um, and you know, it just was so well received and fun and people like we, those videos all still live on YouTube yes, awesome. and they still get tons of views. I mean, let me give you an example too. And you know, one of the things I learned in this early phase is like what you realize is that like it's good content people care about and yeah. like whether or not it has like content is king and queen. Yeah, and a no, subtitle. No. Yeah. People don't care. Like we have this video that Kelly did on icing or I don't even know if it was icing, maybe he'll know what it is, but it literally, we put it on YouTube, we never even put a title on it yeah. ever, there was no <laughs> title, it was just this random video, <laughs> and it had like, like, 150,000 views yeah. like right away. I mean, it was just this funny video and I was like, it just goes to show you when you have like good content. Yeah. Value, you offer value, value to and people. And something that really helps people. Um, it doesn't matter if you have like your logo on yeah. it and sheen yeah. and subtitle and obviously like we've evolved and yeah. we do all those things now, of course. Yeah. But um, it was interesting to see how it didn't really matter because we had we could offer something. And you know, it really did like change people's lives and that was so positive. I mean, there are so many, I, mean, I can't tell you how many emails I get where people send me these paragraphs and paragraphs. They're like, I saw this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. And then I like, I did all this stuff, spent all this money and then I go watch this YouTube yeah. video <laughs> and in like 10 minutes Explains I fix everything. my Yes. You know, so I mean that people go. Poof. Yeah, there's like a magic it's that amazing. happens. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And and talking about solving problems, um, it, it, using your power to solve problems. The stand up kids thing is astounding to me because I didn't. You know, you don't ever realize. Oh, you go to school yeah. and I you always just sit there all day. you just sit there all day. Or you know, whenever I look at these buildings in San Francisco. I know there's going to be a lot of controversy over saying this, but it's like little tiny coffin windows. Yes. So uh, where did that aha moment start with Stand Up Kids and explain well, where you're at yeah, now? Let me, let me tell you the backstory. So in 2010, Kelly did this speech, uh, not speech, like a lecture at Google. He did a Google talk and he called it Deathbound, which is also the name of our book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason for that is, again, it was one of those things he was seeing in our in-house physical therapy clinic. He has all these people coming in and they're like, they're literally over there on the couch waiting for their appointment and they're on their iPhone and they're like this. Yeah. This. And Kelly would walk by and he's like, they're in here for neck pain. <laughs> hundred bucks, it's neck pain, <gasps> neck pain. And then they'd go get on his table and they're like, my neck. neck. Yeah. Right? And, um, uh. and so we just started seeing, he started seeing in his clinic like a bunch of, you know, just 
issues around people who were sitting all the time. And then we started looking into it a little more and realizing like, wow. And so as part of our work through Mobility Wad, you know, when Kelly was speaking and lecturing to teams and corporations, he would say, hey, you know, like everybody's sitting too much and you should probably stand at work. So we started sort of preaching standing desks like early on before there were even any standing desks on the market. Like back then, the only standing desk you'd buy was like $5,000. Yeah. So Super we're like, expensive. hey, get an Amazon box and some yeah. cinder blocks and <laughs> make some, you know, just hack your desk. Of course you guys can MacGyver it together. Yeah, yeah just MacGyver, <laughs> totally MacGyver a standing desk. And so Kelly was going around telling everyone like, hey, you can't sit all the time. And you know, you definitely can't like expect to, you know, go do your triathlon training at six o'clock in the morning and then go sit in your office for 14 hours and then wonder why you're you're in my physical therapy office surprised that you're having an Achilles problem mm. like you have people have to be able to make those connections um, and then we literally nothing even like we didn't even occur to us the kid thing and for like four years and we're at our kids field day and we, we like to work at field day and we were doing the sack races that year you know where you put yeah. the burlap sack yeah, and jump and, you just and it was super interesting because the um, the kids literally couldn't put the sack on their body. Oh, Meaning wow. like, you know, like in order to get the sack on, yeah, it? in order to get the sack on, you need to like lift your knee to your chest and yes. hook the sack and then hook the other sack, oh right? God, they couldn't so do that. They were like falling over. And I'll tell you like we're in Marin County, so we have, the kids are like, we have like a, a lower than the national average level of childhood obesity in Marin County. Mm -hmm. But still it didn't matter. Like it doesn't matter whether they you're a heavy kid or a thin kid. They literally wow. were not mobile and flexible. Kelly also, as part of his research for his book, Ready to Run, saw that, um, this big shift and like if you see kindergartners who don't really sit that much at school mm -hmm. they play more yeah. and then between kindergarten and first grade you saw a lot of kids switch from forefoot running to heel striking yes. which is another symptom of sitting a lot because you're just in you know your foot's at a 90 degree angle all the time so you're not you're not heel striking Right. Striking, yeah. Yeah, like you don't ever, if you go, like go, like I challenge anyone watching this to like go to a preschool and see a kid heel striking, they don't mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's something they learn Sitting how to much. do. Uh. Yeah. And so he saw that, we saw this thing at field day and we looked at each other, we're like, oh my God. Like we've been telling the all these adults. Yeah. And then we're like carting our own kids it starts off. there. We didn't even have yes. to walk in school bus then, we were still like driving <laughs> our kid to school and then you know, they were sitting there all day and we're like, huh, so, you know, we started doing some research. We actually approached the principal. Um, she was super open to it and was like, let's try it. So we did, we put one classroom of standing desks in and we've been, we ended up turning over the next year after that, we turned the whole school into, it's the first all standing school in the world. Awesome. So 450 kids stand wow. at school. Um, and we partnered with a, an organization called Donors Choose. Yep. And then we were also invited to be part of Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, which was like yes, such awesome. a vote of confidence yes. for us right. because they reached out to us um, and we're you know they have a curated list of nonprofits who are doing cool work around getting kids more active at schools and we're the only people who do kids and standing desks um, but since we started which I think we launched in originally in 2014 um, we estimate we have 80,000 kids around the country who either stand or have access to a standing desk in their classroom so it's just a slow movement you know one of the interesting things at the beginning is we really thought we'd have to like convince teachers like this is the best idea you should do this and turns out they require no convincing mm. they're the ones who are on the receiving end of kids who are spending seven and a half hours a day on screens and are getting driven to school and you know are basically sitting every waking hour of their day unless maybe they're at their one hour soccer practice. You know, I mean, now most schools don't have PE anymore. Um, you know, physical activity has been cut in favor of studying for tests. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a, an epidemic. It's a serious problem. Where do you hope to take it? In you know, the I mean, What's what we hope is that at some point state and or federal governments will notice and that they'll see that the research behind this is so positive in terms of kids learning and you know, BMI and, I mean, you name it, if you look at a metric, it's better for kids to be standing while they're learning and at school um, and just for their health generally and for, you know, it's it definitely, it can be a factor in childhood obesity. I mean, there's so many things about it. So our hope is that they will take notice at some point and that every time a new school is built, it's just a given that standing desks mm. are put in or any time a school has infrastructure improvement dollars, standing desks go in. That is you so know, awesome. And just that we want to just keep growing it and growing it and growing it. You know, it's super interesting since you used to be in the TV world, and I wish I could remember the reporter, but it was a Cron guy. Yeah. Came so up. Worked. Yeah, yeah Cron. Uh -huh. And he was sent up to do a story on it early on, and he uh, he admitted this to us later. He came mm -hmm. up to our all-standing school, and he, he got the assignment, and he was like, oh, my God, what? are these Marin County people going to think of next? Like kids yeah. standing at school, yeah. like, oh. They're going to be so tired, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, he went up there just problems. like, 
like whatever. hunched over yeah. like I gotta go do this story yeah. and then he came in and he saw it and he talked to the kids and talked to the teachers and he said he was like he did a 180 when he yeah. watched it in action mm -hmm. and saw the kids and he actually had this moment of realizing that his kid actually had really struggled in school he had a son who would struggled in school and he's like oh my god now that I see this I realize like this would have been so good for my mm -hmm. son who just had tons of energy and didn't have a way to get it out so it was super fun for him to admit that he like went up there thinking this was the weirdest thing ever. Here's the takeaway. As I was interviewing Juliet, I just felt her energy every time she talked about her authentic intention for the CrossFit business, Mobility Wad, Stand Up Kids, is she said that we didn't ever expect any of these to be a business. You just do what you love, what you love, and the rest will follow. But you know what is your business? Your desire and that thing that excites you. So you might think whatever it is that you're doing might be more practical, but when you lead with your heart and you follow that, and that is matched with the gifts that you have, whether it be talking, reading, or writing, or singing, if it's aligned with what you are and you're here to serve others, everything will come together. You know what's funny is that I, I know, because I can speak from my own testimonial, that he's not the only person that has been starret struck. struck. <laughs> or like the fact that like you guys are just full of life and energy and, and passion. I know that word, you know, whatever way you okay. want to use it. Um, and I just like when you are around, you know, it's, it's just a universal law. When you are around positivity or people that are badasses, you become a badass and you become positive or you attract that. And I just feel like that, that's what this space means to me. And I just feel so honored that, you know, that, that this is my second home. Um, oh, but I, w I wanted so to ask you. So to have you in our second home. <laughs> Fit fam. Um, Fit fam. So you were talking about sleeping and all the stuff that you're doing that you guys get a, you know, a full night of sleep. Like how? Being a woman, a mom? What? I know. Um, like, what's the secret? Everybody well, wants to know. I love sleeping, and I always point out to Kelly that women need more sleep than men. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I read it on Facebook, so okay. it must be true. It must be true. It's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> must be 100% true. Um, you know, we've really had, I mean, it was hard when our kids were little because it's really hard to sleep well. So we didn't sleep that well when our kids were li really little. But once we trained them how to be good sleepers, um, you know, we just do not, I mean, that's one place we do not mess around. Like, Kelly and I are total nerds. We go to bed at 9.30 every night. And and we, you know, we try to sleep, I mean, minimum seven and a half hours, but ideally eight and a half hours. And, you know, we just like when we're at work and doing the things we do, like we're on yes. and we're not, we can't You're be as on. We right need to there. be on and present. Yeah. And like the key for me and, and for Kelly too is sleeping. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Kelly, like his mom, both of our moms, but his mom's always talking about he was the kid who like needed to take a three hour nap, like until he was 10 years old. That was me. Yeah, yeah, right. He just is like, we both really need a lot of sleep. And so for us, it's just about prioritizing it. You know, even the walking school bus thing I was thinking as we moved on to another thing, the, the difference actually in that is we'd been driving our kids to school and, um, one of the influences was I read this book called The Power of Habit. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever read yes, it. Yes, I've yeah, awesome heard it. Book. Yeah, it's on my list. It's a great yes. book. Okay. And I read that book and I realized that the whole reason we weren't driving our kids to school is because we'd gotten in the habit of waking up at 645 mm -hmm. instead of 635. And Amazing. by waking up at 635, we created this sort of like sequelae of events that wouldn't allow us to leave in time to walk. So we had no choice but to drive in order to get our kids to school in time. And I realized that this was just a habit. Mm. And that it was like the, the quote you said about the decision to change. Yeah, yeah. You know, I realized I was like, wow, you know, I love sleeping, but I can get up 10 minutes earlier. And if I can get up 10 minutes earlier and walk to school every day, like it will be so good for my psyche. And so it's just that decision. Well, it was the realization that we were just stuck in a bad pattern mm -hmm. um, and that we could give up 10 minutes of sleep in order to make this positive change in our life. But, you know, uh, uh, getting to that point, too, I mean, like, let's be real. The men and men and women have it different. I mean, I feel like women definitely are the stronger sex, but also you have to give birth and you have, you're the nurturer. You are the ones really that has a lot of women have to give their careers up for a while to be yeah. pregnant for nine months and then yeah. to nurse and all that. Yeah, um, it's full on. How do it's you do that? <laughs> it's well, you're like superwoman. Like, how do you do like all this stuff? I mean, I'm sure people yeah. are watching and they're I mean, like, whoa, I'm, tired from I will start by saying idea. I'm really efficient and I'm really good at doing a lot of different things. So that's just something, I don't know if I just came out that way, mm -hmm. but um, it allows me to, you know, I can, in any given day, I can be like doing something on San Francisco CrossFit and then Mobility Wild and Stand Up Kids and doing a little thing on my Death to the Juice Box book, <laughs> and, right? Like I can definitely move around. Um, 
but it's a lot. And, you know, and especially when my kids were little, you know, we, like Kelly and I, you know, especially, here's what I'll say, one of the hardest parts for us was when Mobility Wad was young and San Francisco CrossFit had really taken off. There was like a two or three year period in there where like we weren't doing that great on all these things. I mean, you know, our kids were still little. Kelly was traveling a mm -hmm. ton. He wasn't sleeping enough or, you know, like he was just blown out. Our kids were, you know, like they slept, but they were still little kids and required tons of maintenance. Um, and, you know, we definitely, like, we ha here's what I'll say. We went through a phase in our business where we felt like we had to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. and Learning to say no is huge. I right. told you one of my yes. interns, I yes. told that, we yes, said, but learn I, to say no. I don't regret it because I do think when you're growing a business, that's yes. actually the right thing to do. Like, we kind of crushed ourselves early on and we definitely took it. We took yes. a hit in sleep and in our exercising and probably in our eating because we were traveling and stuff. But it was worth it for us to have that period of business growth of saying yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. But you're exactly right. We reached a point where we were like, okay, we can't actually live like this forever. Like, we have yeah. to sleep and take care of our bodies and we can't really drink alcohol. Yeah. And <laughs> And we have to be able to say no, and that's of course so empowering because we still say yes to a lot of things, but we have so many opportunities and speaking engagements and you name it come our way. And you know, we do have to say no to a lot of things yes. now that's because so we huge. are yes. we actually are not superheroes. Yes. We're just regular people, yes. and so we do yeah. want to hang out with our kids. Yes. So it's a balance for sure. Yeah, and I think let me add to that though, um, and just hearing you talk about all this stuff is taking time for yourself. That's what saying no means. And for me, I also learned to say no when, even if I don't want to loan you a dollar, no. no. And it's just so empowering right. learning to no. just to say no. You don't have to give, no. No, you, you know, explanation, explanation, nothing. No, yeah, so you like, no, no, I can't, you know. And exactly. I think that is so critical yeah. um, to, like, you know, the, the putting the oxygen mask over you first before you put it on other people. And that's what right. you guys do. And that's what I've learned to do here. You know, I've learned hugely to, I used to get so busy. I look back, it was funny, cause you know, Facebook, it pops up. It's like seven years ago yeah. and I was so chunky in my face. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> or like my trip to Peru, it's like, I had this like belly pushing out. And I had vow vowed to be one of those people that never wanted my belly to be so big that uh, like yeah, I yeah, can yeah. see my junk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but I, <laughs> and <you're> like, ah. <laughs> yeah, right. But <laughs> no, yeah. Um, but I realized that no matter how busy that I got, that I need to, put an hour or two or calendar in a yeah. workout. Yeah, calendar in, instead of going out to eat for a meeting, yeah. we'll do a walking right. meeting. But right. that's what this has taught me too, like the awareness, the mindfulness around me and the world around me. Yeah. And I, like I said, I just am so honored to be here and be your your friend, not We're just friends. to be one, I know, one of your clients but or customers or whatever, but just to be one of your friends and fit fam and just fit to, fam. it brings me so much joy and makes me feel so alive being here that I, you know, before anybody knocks it, I just want to say, you know what, come in, try it. I've just been lucky that I'm, I, you know, every time I go, I go travel, like I said, other people are like, oh, you, the, you go to the, the San Francisco CrossFit, CrossFit yeah, box, yeah. the Starrettes, well, and I'm like, you know what, really though, it, that's great and all that, but it really comes down to the right. personal connections that right. we make. And like you and I, we always talk about like life and yeah. these like life lessons that we learned. Right. So I wanted to ask you a couple quick questions yeah. here. I have to say too that like, yes. Like we have the most awesome staff here. You do, <laughs> yes. They, yes. you know, and, and that's yes. why it's funny because everyone's like, oh, Kelly and Juliet's gym, Kelly and Juliet's gym, but it's yeah. like, it's so, of course. Yeah, it's a team, like anything, it's your it's tribe, a team. same with my team, yes. Right. It's, it's a, a team tribe. of awesome people who are on every single day, they're like giving of themselves yes. to create an awesome yeah. space. And it's not a yeah. job for them. No. Because when you're a job, you're like, rah, rah. Uh -huh. but it's really right. like w the place that you go and you feel alive and I come here to play. It's, it's, I've come here to work my ass off and I sweat and I, you know, but I've learned so much about letting go of that little boy, like that blog that I wrote about, mm -hmm. I am 35 yeah. and I hated my body. That's right. what, that was my first line for all these years, this body that yeah. worked for me, you yeah. know. I can't believe and, you're 35. I, no. I'm almost 40. Ah. <laughs> they say Asian don't raise it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. But good genes, no, yeah. I just, it's, it's just really about being a mindful of what I eat, yeah. how I connect with people, because if you put out bad energy, I feel like that makes you, like, yeah. there's a, like yeah. a, makes you feel. Yeah. And being look, emo is a grow. choice. 
Yes. It's always I try to tell my kids because one of our kids is a little more like up and down and of course I want to like, you know, I want her to be a complex human with all the emotions and yes. all the feels. I yes. do. I want that for her. But I'm also like, but you know, how you project yourself to the world is like how you're going to be received. I mean, there's this really interesting research that shows actually little kids who are, I mean, the cute thing makes me sad. It makes us like look like gorillas, but little kids who are cute but who are also friendly uh -huh. and, and um, engage with adults, they get like 10 times more positive attention. Yes. And the kids who don't. Yes. Um, and then that like compounds itself over life, and then those kids tend to feel like more positive mm -hmm. about themselves and feel like they can do more things, right? Because they're like putting out into the world joy yeah. and getting joy back. Yeah. yeah. Versus you know some kids who aren't doing that, and I mean that's totally it's kind of sad actually because we're like wild animals in that yeah. way as humans. Yeah. But it's interesting because yes. it's like I do I feel like that what you put out you get back. Mm. So my, a couple questions just uh, I'm gonna ask you and Kelly the same okay. things. So uh, you know just. Really Fire. quick answer, uh, you know, really quick answers. I want to see how you guys match up here. Um, um, this question I love and I always ask because I'm all about superhero, uh, superheroes, but what is your superhero power that you have now, that one that you have? Um, I would say ability to do a lot of things. That's okay. my superhero power. Which one did you wish you had? Jeez, wish I had. Um, I wish that I could just sing like Beyonce. <laughs> what about dance? I haven't seen you well, dance here yet. Jeez, I mean, yes. No, dance like Michael Jackson. Okay. Yeah, it would be two. Well, yeah, I always okay. am like, if God, if I could sing and dance, I'd love to be a rock star. I know. I, well, if you could cho only choose one, which one would it be, singing or dancing? I don't know, because I love some I Michael love Jackson both. dancing, yes, and too. I love Beyonce singing. Um, I would say singing. There's like okay. something about just being able to like stand there in front of a microphone and yeah. have that come out. Like if you're like Rihanna and you yeah. stand there at a microphone and that comes out, like that would be awesome. I think you use dancing more, but I mean, I pretend I sing like Adele is, is in, the, like, in the, the shower. The thing is, though, <laughs> is like you can suck at dancing and still do it. Yeah. Like I can like go to a wedding and get my groove on and like <laughs> totally enjoy dancing. I can do it, but like I can't go to a wedding and sing like Rihanna. Yeah. Oh, true, true that. True that. <laughs> meaning of life is. What is the meaning of life? I mean, for me, I think it's about sort of creating community and giving back to people. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're most proud of here, yep. is being yes. able to create community yes. above all else. Yes. Around fitness, about personal connections. Your pet peeve? People who can't write an email and or can't respond to it soon. Those, that is my, those are my top oh, five. Yeah. Yeah. Like if they don't put dear Tuan I know. or hi I Tuan. I saw this thing. I was so annoyed. I saw this thing going around Facebook and it's like greetings and signatures are dead on email. And I was like, oh, no, uh, 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 uh. no. The no, how no, are no. you? No, I think there's yes. just, yeah, I think. I think yeah. so too. Yeah. I'm just kind of I old like school like that. I like to get a nice email from yes. people that is written me in too. the English language. Me too. Yes, me too. And I always tell my students, I'm not your homie. Do not write, you know. No. Don't do hey, Love, comma. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Hey, XOXOXO. <laughs> right. Um, risk means. Because you guys have taken so many risks. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about... I know, like yeah. the background of... Yeah. yeah. Um, the background of your being a national... Making yourself uncomfortable. Whitewater champion. Making yourself uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Oh, that's big. That's a huge life lesson. Failure means... Not learning from your mistakes. Mm. That's big. And that leads to the next one, what, uh, what I regret. Do you regret anything? You don't seem like you're a regretter. I don't have a lot of regrets. I've really tried to live my life so that I don't have regrets. Yes. <laughs> uh, my biggest, biggest accomplishment is? I, it would be two. Can I say two yes, things? Yes, two, two. Um, <laughs> being, I think one, um, being able to be in a totally happy, joyful marriage with my husband, even though we're business partners. Mm. Um, because that's different from how I grew up. That's a whole nother podcast. That's topic. a whole other <laughs> podcast. Um, Especially with both and, of you guys, because yeah. you guys are and both very two, alpha. And then two, that so far so good on being able to raise like two totally rad daughters. Mm, they are rad. They're, They're so rad. cute. And yeah. speaking of joy, joy means, or I'm most joyful when I'm with my family and my community. Mm. That's like every day. That's I awesome. Know. Okay, so Kelly is. You can be nice or not. No. no. <laughs> He is hilarious. Yes. That's the word I'm going to use today. Yes. He's many things, but yes. hilarious is oh, one yes, of them. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it's he so funny. He makes me laugh yeah. and laugh and yeah. laugh. Like, we literally, like, lay there in bed at night and, like, laugh. Yeah. 
that's one very important thing for me yeah. in terms of like life partner kind yeah. of trait is being able to laugh. Yeah. You know, because when you're old and wrinkly, what? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's also like we we say this about each other, but like he's like my greatest training partner. Mm. You know, a lot of couples don't seem to be able to like train and work out together, yeah. or, like do sports together, but like we totally can. Mm. You know, and we love yes. doing that together. Yeah, and you guys, it's funny because didn't you say that when you are on vacation, that's when you guys yes. are working? Okay. Out? Yes. Okay. So we know we're on vacation if we train and do a sport. <laughs> you know, we are love like it. beach yeah. vacation. Yeah. We don't go lay on the beach yeah. and we're not beach yeah. vacationers like You're if doing a we're on vacation <laughs> we like have done a full on workout and like a sport uh -uh. or like a hike or whatever like we've love done it. two things love then it. we're on vacation love 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 that okay so my truth is i think i'm i want to try to like bring love and joy into the world mm. however i can mm. And that's with every single email, every single connection, everything. not even just the it business matters. part. No, right? everything with yeah. my friends and my family and. And what do you community. dare? What do you dare, listeners, viewers, to do? Other people you meet to do? Well, we didn't even get into the whole risk conversation, but I think mm. make yourself uncomfortable. Mm. Make yourself uncomfortable. Whatever that is, whether it's like trying new foods or <laughs> stop eating certain things you're eating or go skydiving or try something, learn something new. You know, I try to be like a constant student. And yes. I really do try to do things that make me uncomfortable. Yeah. Even if they're simple things like going to the spinning class that you've never been to. Yeah. That yeah. makes you super nervous. Like, go do it. Go try a CrossFit class. Like, it doesn't need to be something extreme like skydiving. Yeah. Or like, white water rafting be, and national champion. It doesn't need champion. to be any yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. It doesn't need to be, and it can I, literally be like minor things. Like, do something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. I think that's a misconception because when you say you, you know, you should take a risk or you should dare, it right. doesn't mean that if you're uncomfortable <gasps> you don't need to go jumping like, out of a no. plane, don't. Yeah, you don't need to go like climb El Capitan yeah. or something. Yeah. It does not need to be at that level at all. It can be little teeny things in your life. Yeah. But anything that like makes you a little bit uncomfortable. I would love to talk to you more about risk next time to invite yes. you back on the show, but I'm so, so glad that I dared myself to come here <laughs> because I can do a pull up, now I can do more than 10, and then I couldn't do handstands. Thanks, Roop, oh, my yeah. favorite classes. Uh, but now I can walk all you across can do the rig. Like it's your job in oh, life. I know. Maybe I'll be a professional handstander next. <laughs> next. But Make thank you for holding this space oh, and this thank container you. Thank for you us for to be. Me badasses i mean we call, you call us athletes but it's just like i don't even know the word for it but this is my church it is i've it learned is, so much church. about myself personally professionally spiritually and letting go of that or visit that 10 year old boy when he visits and say oh you know i'm feeling fat or feeling ugly some days or feeling like less than or not like i accomplished enough yeah like i remember that you know like hey i can finish a lot no but mm -hmm. really i take what i've learned here um just also um on the personal and professional and spiritual realm, like into my daily life. And I mean, I can't thank you enough for that. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Truth Dare Talk. Trust your truth, I dare you.